Sports Vinegar Governance. Um, I'm Tom McGonigal, and I'll be the helper for this talk. I'll be shuttling the microphone back and forth, and trying to facilitate the questions. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, have each of the speakers introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Greg Comstock, product designer on Spinnaker uh, for about a year over at Netflix. Oh, I'm part of the UI UX SIG. Uh, sometimes I drop into the As Code SIG. Uh, did the Spinnaker Summit planning SIG as well. I'm Rob Zener. I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix for the last three years and um, the chair of the technical oversight committee. Uh, Ethan Rogers, I am the co-lead of the Kubernetes SIG. I also serve on the Technical Oversight Committee. Um, I'm a staff, staff software engineer at Harvard. And I am Eric Smaggy. I am a software engineer at Google. And like Ethan, I am co-chair of the Kubernetes SIG and on the Technical Oversight Committee. I'm Maggie Nettergill, also um, an engineer at Google. And I'm a co-lead on the UI SIG and also involved in the Kubernetes SIG. And my name's Andrew Blower. I run Delivery Engineering at Netflix. And I'm the panel moderator. And so I thought we'd kick off the panel um, and start with how can someone get involved with Spinnaker, the project, the community? So I think one thing we want to highlight is that the lowest barrier to entry is not necessarily making a code contribution. So there are other ways to kind of ramp up to be involved in the community. And it could be something as simple as your operator in Solomon Spinnaker and you're reading documentation and there's a gap that you notice and you fill it and you make a PR and start GitHub repo. That's a very welcome contribution. Um, another thing you could do is join the Slack community. There are a lot of folks in there who aren't necessarily like core code contributors, but who are you know, helping other members of the community with questions. They've run into a similar troubleshooting situation, helping them debug it. Um, so those are just two kind of easy ways to get involved. And um, for those of you that came to the three of our talk on the Kubernetes provider, yesterday one thing we emphasized there that I'll say again for this audience is, um, come to attend a SIG meeting. Even if you don't have kind of any change you want to make or any code contributions, these things are not just for people that are core commanders. These are for users, operators of Spinnaker, and we want to understand how you're using Spinnaker, where you see gaps, um, where you've run into strange issues that you might have worked around, but you feel like there's probably an easier way or a better way that Spinnaker could support that. So please come to those things. That's a great way to get involved. Yeah, and I think um, to just kind of like build on top of that, um, a lot of SIG attendance is very operator heavy, so all the people who are responsible for running Spinnaker within an organization. And so one of the things that we would really love to have start happening is the actual end users, people who are, if you're operating Spinnaker, they're your customers. Um, because we want to make Spinnaker not only easy for the operator, but we want to make it easy for the end user as well, because um, that ultimately makes your job easier. Um, so. Yeah, just everything that Eric and Maggie said. Everything that they said is totally legit, uh, but it's been very much focused on uh, like changes and problems and that kind of thing. One thing that we really want to see as well is just hopes and dreams of you as an operator or as a, as a user. Um, Spinnaker wouldn't be where it is today unless people were coming to the table with new ideas of things that can be done just to improve or, or new features that we haven't really thought about. So any and all ideas, whether it's feedback on things that are actually broken or could work a little bit better or totally new areas that Spinnaker can integrate it into and can start managing would be phenomenally valuable. Just wanted to add, going to the SIG meetings can be as simple as dropping in, staying on mute, don't even turn your camera on. If you're just curious, on a particular topic, uh, you can just drop in and, and listen in. Uh, but if you want to participate, all the all the relevant SIG docs are uh, editable, so you can just add a bullet point uh, and put your name next to it, and we just kind of run through the list every week. So uh, it can be as involved or as little as you want it. There we go. <coughs> uh, 
stand up. I can't just sit there. I am going to hand the mic off so we don't have to have like that. So um, a SIG is a special interest, interest group. There are a number of SIGs. There. You mentioned a Kubernetes SIG. There's a, a Doc SIG. There's a security SIG. AWS SIG. Pipelines is code. Spinnaker is code. And I think there's even one kind of in flight. Operations. Operations SIG. Platform. So clearly, security. So clearly, there's uh, at least a half dozen SIGs, and probably uh, more that are coming. And there's probably, hopefully, some SIGs in your minds. And so my question to, we'll start with Ethan. Um, how does one go about suggesting a SIG? And then feel free if you want to add in this. So um, I guess when it comes to SIG formation, it is I can do that. So it's like. Um, it, when it comes to SIG formation, it's like the first place you start is just an idea, right? Um, we've actually had a lot of ideas for different SIGs, um, some of which have panned out, some of which uh, might have been served better under another SIG, something like that. Um, I believe we have a proposal template. Okay, yeah. We, so we have a proposal template in the Spinnaker slash community repo. Um, where you can propose a SIG. There's a number of pull requests. There's actually an open one right now proposing a operation SIG um, that's going to be led by Salesforce, I believe. Um, but yeah, and it's really what we want to try to capture is just like a group of people who have some type of interest in any area of Spinnaker. It doesn't have to be you know one specific cloud provider or one specific feature area. It could be a cross-cutting kind of say. Um, but we'll, what we really want is people who care about a specific feature area and really want to invest heavily um, in that area. So, you know, project governance is essentially a, a large term that essentially tries to capture kind of the, the processes by which, you know, the community can, can interact in some same fashion. It's not like a behind-the-scenes club where people make decisions. And so to your point, SIG, the SIG process is, is documented, and it's, uh, it's on GitHub. So uh, Maggie, what, what SIG are you on? And then tell us about like, the responsibilities in terms of what it means to be on a SIG, a SIG lead, and whatnot. Sure, so I'm a co-lead on the UI UX SIG with Chris Nealon from Netflix. Um, and the responsibilities include, first of all, filling out the template, um, as we mentioned, if it a new SIG. And secondarily, we have kind of charters, I think they're called, that we publish with sort of the objectives and the roadmap of each SIG. So you kind of need a plan for what your SIG is meant to discuss and achieve. Um, thirdly, maintaining the agenda and setting the meeting time and making sure that both, you know, the Google Hangout and the agenda are publicly available so that anyone can join and knows when to join. And then fourthly, kind of, you know, just running the meeting itself, making sure everyone's voice is heard, um, kind of leading the open discussion that tends to take place at the end of the meeting. And then out of band of the actual SIG meetings, an additional responsibility of the SIGs has been issue triage in that kind of domain area. So if an issue comes in on the Spinker GitHub project, um, it will be tagged with that SIG's label, and then the SIG is responsible for managing some type of flow and determining, you know, who will address this issue? Should we address this issue? Is this a beginner-friendly issue? Can we rub it to someone in the community? Um, am I missing anything? You brought up an interesting uh, subject, issue triage. And uh, the Spinnaker GitHub organization has over a dozen repos. And those repos each have issue tracking. And then there, maybe some people in the room are aware there's a Spinnaker Spinnaker repo where there's also issues captured. So to talk through kind of the challenges with issue triage, if I'm an end user, I have a bug with Spinnaker, where do I, where do I file that bug? Especially if I don't even know that it's, let's say, cloud driver, where do I file it? And then how, what is the process of triage and how could we do it better? Who would like to take that? Um, so we actually have all of our issues consolidated under the Spinnaker Spinnaker repo. Occasionally, as we're kind of spinning up a new microservice, we'll, for a time or period, kind of have issues filed directly against that repo. So 
uh, maybe you remember like a year or two ago, how your had issues in its repo. But at this point, um, most of the issues are filed under Spinnaker Spinnaker. Um, so I can talk a little bit about life cycle is of an issue when you file it. Um, and I guess maybe a little honesty here, like what that life cycle kind of has been in the past and maybe what we're moving towards, because I think this is definitely a work in progress. Um, so I think in the past, um, a lot of issues under Spinnaker Spinnaker weren't super properly reviewed. It was sort of more of an ad hoc process where if somebody who kind of recognized something in the issue title or worked in that area saw it and picked it up, then it would kind of get some attention and maybe fix, and if not, it might kind of fall through the cracks. Um, and I think a few of you may have encountered Spinnaker bot um, who looks at every issue but waits 45 days tags the issue stale and then waits 45 more days and then closes the issue. Um, and I think recently we kind of decided this is probably not a great experience for people um, trying to get involved in the community because as we talked about earlier, um, getting involved is not just about doing PRs yourself and making code changes. Um, this is for many people their first interaction with the Spinnaker community. Um, so we really wanted to try to improve that process. Um, so what we've done now and again full disclosure this is a work in progress so we're hoping to improve that. Um, is as issues come in, we're tagging those with the responsible SIG. Um, and then that gets into the process that Maggie described earlier, where kind of the SIG leads of each SIG go through the issues assigned to their SIG, um, and then take some sort of follow-up action. Um, and I think really our goal here is, there are some issues that we won't fix, that maybe we think it's out of scope for Spinnaker, or maybe it's a reasonable idea, but there's nobody really that has time to work on it now. Um, but we really like that to be an actual discussion on the issue. You know, a comment saying, hey, this is a great idea, but um, we don't really have anyone that's free to work on it right now, but if you'd like to, let's talk about it. Or maybe in some cases, hey, this is not something we really think fits in with Spinnaker, but we'd love to understand your use case better. Um, but really trying to actually have a real discussion between humans about this rather than just kind of having things auto-close. Um, and so there are still issues that will fall between the cracks because we don't have perfect SIG coverage. So I think that that's the part of it that's maybe the most work in progress. Um, I think we recently just added a GitHub label SIG none, which is to at least give us visibility into the issues that are falling between SIGs. Um, I think we're going to use that to try to understand where we can add new SIGs. And then hopefully at some point, um, once we have better SIG coverage and those SIG none issues are less numerous, we'll maybe come up with some process to kind of just go through those. I don't think we're ever going to get 100% coverage. Um, yeah. So we're getting warmed up. If you have questions, just raise your hand and I will uh, let me, we want this to be interactive. Um, I wanted to kind of pick on something from the sense of we have SIGs and we have a steering committee and we have a technical oversight committee. Uh, what's the difference between them? Who would like to take that? All right, I'll start from uh, hmm. I'll start from the bottom up. So, as as normal people in the community, the first point of contact is typically going to be a SIG, and they are responsible for a certain domain inside of the Spinnaker. So you have, for example, the AWS SIG. They are responsible for the EC2 cloud provider, ECS, Lambda, and that sort of thing. So any issues, pull requests, feature requests, they are the people that facilitate the workflow around that. And anyone's able to join these SIGs, and then there's a handful of people that lead it, just kind of in terms of making sure that the cog keeps moving. Um, and then the layer above that is the technical oversight committee, and our main charter is to drive consensus across all the SIGs and all the companies that are involved heavily inside the Spinnaker um, to move in a single direction. Um, it's totally reasonable that, let's say, Netflix will want to do one particular thing uh, that doesn't totally match with another company, and that's fine. That's the way that open source goes, but we want to make sure that there's a unified vision that everyone is generally going towards, and that's the, that's the main charter for the Technical Oversight Committee, and also to act as kind of a um, tiebreaker if there's a conflict for a particular SIG. They don't know how to resolve a particular issue. It can be escalated up to us to advise or potentially um, recommend a particular solution one way or another. And then the level above that is the steering committee. The steering committee is uh, similarly 
chartered with uh, direction, but it's more of at a prod level and in deciding what are the SIGs that should exist um, and like where is the prod itself going rather than uh, the technical implementation. They're defining, well, Spinnaker should be excellent at delivering uh, safe and continuous software delivery, but maybe also for data or whatever. Um, so that's, that's the general hierarchy that uh, the governance group has. Remember, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. So I'm a community member, and I understand how to create a SIG. Uh, but in this case, I just have like a great idea. You know, whatever, I want to add this new cloud provider for like, like we already have Zalibaba, I think is in flight, Tencent. Is it, let's imagine there's a new cloud provider, you know, Zen. Nomad, let's say. Nomad. Uh, I want to add Nomad support to Spinnaker. Uh, or I want to change the UI to be, you know, let's say, uh, handle a different type of like organizational structure. How do I, where do I start? What do I do? Who wants to take this? I'll take the UI one, for sure. Uh, so I'll half answer this. Uh, if you have any UI recommendations, uh, UI UX SIG is the place for you. We don't only talk about the existing UI, we talk very forward thinking. Uh, all the design locks for new features are shared in that SIG and tossed around. Uh, so if you have, even if you just have an anecdote, like this part of the UI is really frustrating for me, or people at my company have really stumbled with this, uh, just drop in. Uh, any little bit of feedback is, is welcomed. And the more that I hear the same story, the, the higher in the priority uh, fixing that becomes. Um, and so at a higher level, um, if you have like a, a feature or something that you would really like to see happen or something that you might be interested in working on, one of the things that we've had a lot of success around is the, the concept of RFCs or proposals. Um, I myself have done quite a few, Rob, I know you've done a lot, um, but really that's, a, that's kind of a great place to one, share the technical design like of what you want to do. Um, it's also a really good place to share what is the what is the user story, what is the actual problem that this thing is trying to solve. Um, and with that, it gives us all kind of a chance to share anecdotes about things that might be related. It might help us all kind of come to a consensus on what a particular feature or change will either you know give us or take away. What are the trade-offs? Um, and that's to kind of like reference Isaac's talk earlier this morning, we as a community are kind of responsible for driving this forward. It's not just it doesn't fall on Google or Netflix or Armory or Pivotal, um, but it, it's, it's all of our thing. And the more people, the more brains that we have on our problem, the better it's going to be for everybody. And when it comes to the RFCs, we're not looking necessarily for the most in-depth, like, 30-page document of how everything is going to be specifically implemented. It can start as just an idea, like, I had an idea, I want to create a cloud provider, and for XYZ reason, and it can just be a jump start into a conversation of, okay, you want to do this major feature into Spinnaker, here are the things that people have generally in the past had to reason about before actually doing a technical implementation. So it's really front-loading a certain degree of uh, of problem solving before actually having to invest in doing a bunch of code and then getting feedback at code time and pull request time where there's been a lot of effort already put in and potentially um, questions as to like, well, why didn't I get feedback on this earlier? Well, the RFC process is there to help people be as efficient as possible. Uh, where would someone submit the Nomad Provider RFC? <laughs> there is a community repo inside of Spinnaker GitHub organization, so it's just community, and um, there's a template inside of an RFC directory inside of there, and you can just copy that. 
make it a file and make a pull request. And then people will start um, making comments to it. The template itself gives a general flow for potentially what you could fill in. It's totally optional to follow that convention. And also gives some hints of like, hey, this is the kind of content that we'd be looking for inside of this section. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll repeat it if easier that's okay. fine. <clears throat> So my question is like, uh, I've been into this journey for the last 10 months working at Salesforce. Um, so one aspect is like the community is contributing, but another aspect is like long range plan, like what is the vision and architect, like for example, take for example, Cloud Drive. I come here, everybody says that there is a challenge with Cloud Drive. There's no challenge with Cloud Drive. For us? <laughs> <laughs> even like, you know, even all our XX at Salesforce is like, you know, not sleeping because of Cloud Drive. Okay, the stability issues, how, how it's going to scale and all these things. So what is the thinking around like long-term planning? Is there something top-down as a special interest group can influence? And like, like, you know, you understand what I'm talking about. Did, Did you all hear that question? question? Did everyone here hear that question? So essentially, if, if there's an issue with like CloudDriver and the executives are uh, yeah. not sleeping at night, um, how, do, how do we as a community address it? Yeah, address it and also What's provide a vision for it as a kind of top-down rather than waiting for the community to come together versus Guiding the community, that's yeah. all. Yeah, is there a proactive roadmap? Like, are you, is the Spinner community doing anything? <laughs> More answer. Um, so, uh, to be like totally transparent, this is something that we're actively trying to do. We, I think we actually just published our first like cross organization roadmap with what everything is, everybody's working on. Um, and I think part of that effort is really starting to collaborate more across organizations. I think governance gives us a really great medium or platform from which to do that, um, where we take feedback, right? There's a lot of different companies in SIGs and different organizations getting all this feedback. Um, and that kind of like higher level roadmap is kind of going to be the result of that going forward. Um, as far as like the lower level stuff, like cloud driver stability issues, right? That's really where this, like the SIGs are gonna be like the front line for all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, and I think to a certain extent, we can predict some of that, right? Like at Netflix, you guys are gonna have, you're gonna have problems well before the community has them. But at the same time, your, the patterns at which Netflix experiences different issues is gonna be significantly different than smaller organizations, organizations using different cloud providers. And so it's part of the TOC's responsibility probably to start figuring out how to address, I'm not signing this up for anything specific, but um, to figure out how to address that and how to make sure we instill the confidence of the larger community. Actually, uh, do you yeah, have one yet? <laughs> I think, um, again, this is still pretty new, and so this might be a little bit aspirational, but I think that the way I sort of see that happening is people bringing issues to the SIG, and the SIG, and the SIG leads sort of noticing, hey, I think there's a more fundamental problem here. But I think one example of this is didn't exactly follow the governance process, but in Kubernetes, we noticed that people run into a lot of issues when they had a lot of accounts. Um, and that was this thing that came up a lot during the Kubernetes SIG. Um, and so I think, in that case, it was mostly within the Kubernetes SIG we were able to solve that, but I think that once the SIG sort of realizes, hey, there's kind of a more fundamental architectural problem here or something that we might need to do that affects more than our SIG or something that we might need buy-in. You know, this is not something that we can just kind of do off the side of our desk that we might need buy-in. I think um, we also have a, I think it's bi-weekly or monthly um, SIG lead and TOC sync. And I think that is a place where there's that communication between SIGs and the Technical Oversight Committee. So I think that, you know, the Technical Oversight Committee and the Steering Committee are never going to hear about issues except through bubbling up through SIGs, but I think that I think that if this process is working well, those issues will bubble up through the SIGs, and then the Technical Oversight Committee or the Steering Committee, as the case may be, will notice these issues that have been raised them by the SIGs and then help guide the whole community to solve them. Can't say that that's happened exactly yet, but I think that that's how I see that working. Thank you. So speaking of CloudDriver, let's let's go in on that one. So CloudDriver uh, is the interface, let's say, to different cloud providers. And we mentioned there's an AWS SIG. And so the gentleman from Salesforce mentions he has challenges with CloudDriver. Uh, 
If I have challenges with CloudDriver, and let's say I'm using Azure or GCP or you know, Zen, where do I get started? Like, who do I talk to? How do I, we've talked about hot filing issues, but what if like, I just have a question? Uh, how do I even find out who's like, the most knowledgeable on CloudDriver? Uh, where do I start? I know it is. <laughs> so this is one of the major issues that we've been trying to solve uh, relatively recently. And one of the proposed ideas is that we're introducing code owners into all the different repos. Uh, so that it's documented inside of each individual repository of who are the actual point of contacts for a particular point of like piece of code, and specifically for uh, for Cloud Driver, you can go into any of the cloud providers and see who are like the main contributors for these particular uh, pieces of code, um, and and that's one way. But if you want something a little bit more uh, human contact and touch. The, uh, the Spinnaker Slack is, is a great point of contact, and there's a operations channel as well as a development channel or dev channel. Um, and depending on what you actually need, you can go into one of those channels and start raising questions. And there will be people that are domain experts that can respond. Um, one thing that the TOC really wants to um, add is a SIG for every cloud provider. If you want to be inside of Spinnaker Core and you're a cloud provider, you must have a SIG that kind of oversees things. Because Spinnaker is, is a very large and complex thing, and one of the most large components of that is a particular cloud provider. So in the Azure case, we're going to be reaching out to all the different points of contact for these different cloud providers and encouraging them to create a SIG so that users have a way to get in contact with the people that are responsible for building these things, and then being able to bubble up issues and that kind of thing. There's like a, a channel for every SIG, so if you went, just went into Slack and search SIG dash, you can see, kind of communicate directly with the leads and members of each SIG in Slack. And one addition, if anyone has any ideas on how we can make this process better, we are more than welcome to hear these ideas. Any any idea is, is a good idea. If you have an idea on uh, how to improve the governance process, the first point of contact I think would probably be to create an issue inside the community repo and describe the issue that you are experiencing and then potential resolutions. It doesn't even need to propose a resolution, just raising the fact that there is an issue is a great first start point. So last year at the, no, two years ago at the Spinnaker Summit, we, we had a discussion about Slack. Uh, if you are in the Slack channel, you may notice that we're using the um, free version. Uh, and so there's no history. And so Slack is really good if you're like in the moment, you can get a hold of, let's say, Maggie, and you can ask her questions. What? There's history. There's history now? Yeah. Who's paying for it? No way. Something like that. Something. Okay, <laughs> somebody's paying for it. That's awesome. Never mind. But actually, my, my, my point is still going to be valid. Uh, the community wanted a long-term uh, place to ask questions, and so we set up a forum. And we recently were talking, and it was clear that the forum wasn't getting a lot of love. So what do we want to do about the forum? identified the issue that it's it's not a place that we typically think about when we're looking to interact with the community. There's so much activity inside of Slack uh, that when we start thinking about where are the where's the community trying to communicate with us, um, the the forum isn't really one of the spots that we think about. And it's a challenge to maintain all these different avenues for for communication where you've got people that are watching and interacting with Stack Overflow. There's people that are watching and interacting with our community forum and specific to Spinnaker, and then there's Slack, and then there's GitHub. Um, I think that we would probably do well to consolidate some of the avenues for communication, and specifically with regards to the forum, I think probably 
folding that into Stack Overflow where there's already a whole lot of users that are already interacting with that platform is probably the way forward. Um, but at this point, I don't think there's any clear answer as to what is going to happen with that. Um, we would love, again, to get any feedback on this whole process and the problem. Does anyone in the audience uh, use Discourse, the current Spinnaker forum? I've landed there before. You've landed there. Okay, so there's one person in the audience that knows it exists. Okay, so there's a few. Would there be any objections if we shut it down? Okay, that's good feedback. <laughs> uh, so, there are, we talked about there's SIGs, there's uh, TOC, SC, there's a way to create uh, requests for comments, we're gonna look at code ownership, or at least a file so you can figure out who you're talking to. Uh, even, we, we already elaborated, there's a number of SIGs that we know need to exist, or need to be created, so we plan on creating those. Uh, let's talk about the other roles that the governance policy established and that we're you know, obviously advocating. There is the notion of a reviewer and then a notion of an approver. Uh, how does one go about becoming those things? How is that process working and you know, is it, how can we make it better? Who would like to take this? So like the um, other templates that we've mentioned, like adding a new cloud provider and making an RFC, there are templates in the Spinnaker slash community repo um, for becoming an approver and reviewer. And I don't know if I'll remember all the criteria off the top of my head, but the gist of it is that you've been um, a consistent contributor. I think it's like a handful of meaningful code changes um, to the services that you want reviewership and approvership of, as well as, I think, two to three members of the community to sponsor you, just two. Um, any other big ones that I'm missing? Uh, a slight correction. Um, when it comes to the reviewer, you don't actually have to make any code contributions. It's just a matter of getting involved in the pull request that exists and making a meaningful code review. Um, just getting in and starting to become familiar with what kind of changes are happening is the foundation for which you can start to get involved inside of the actual code of Spinnaker. And then from there, you can start making changes because you'll be more educated on different moving pieces and then that's where you launch into the approver where we are expecting a certain minimum bar of meaningful code contributions from them. So that's kind of the, the progression is that first we're just getting involved, looking, getting feedback, and then finally providing uh, new code changes, whether it be for bugs or features or that kind of thing. Uh, is there a process by which you, like, let's say, age out, so to speak? Are you a reprover forever? What happens here? Um, right now, there's no explicit workflow or life cycle around um, once you become a reviewer or once you become an approver uh, and you go stagnant, like you disappear from the community. There's no explicit uh, language as far as I can recall that, um, that you will lose this access, but that's one of the things that we're looking at evaluating to see. Is it something that you use it or lose it, or if you just get it once, you keep it forever? And it's of my personal opinion that you need to use it or lose it. Because if someone gets an approver access and that gives them the access to click the green button on any pull request, you kind of want to make sure that these people are still in touch with the community and still in touch with the code base so that they can make a solid judgment call of whether or not this is an actual thing that should get merged in. Um, and if I were to just make up a requirement right now, which I will, um, I would say if you weren't active in the community in say like 90 days, I think that that would spawn the process of us reaching out and saying, hey, we haven't seen you around in a while what's going on, and at least kickstart the process of like getting them folded back into the community rather than just immediately kicking them out without any uh, explanation. Mm -hmm. 
90 days is like an average uh, vacation for Europe. <laughs> vacation 120 days. Vacation's legit. Go on as much vacation as you want, but I'll be very happy. Okay, so, yes. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering about, like, uh, talking about the seeds, and the seeds has a purpose, right? Um, and the purpose usually happens in time zones that are in the U.S. Um, um, I was watching another talk from people from South Africa. Uh, they're in the same time zone as me. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, could we make some seeds that are <clears throat> basically not uh, seeds at the same level as the U.S. ones, but uh, targeting time time zones, basically. I got applause. So, for what it's worth, I will hand it off. So, at the CDF, this is also an open question because there are open SIDS and uh, open, you know, TOC and board meetings. Uh, actually, never mind the board meeting. The TOC meeting part of the CDF is open and it's at 9 a.m. Pacific, and it's unfriendly to those, let's say, in Asia. And so there's an open question of like, what we do about that. So at the CDF level, the, the idea is that we'll hold the meetings at different cadences, like at different times. So we'll do it bi-weekly, but like at 9 a.m. You know, this week, and then in two weeks, we'd hold it at 9 p.m. type thing. So that's an idea at the CDF level to address different time zones. I'd be curious. And then you had a question. So I'll let them riff on that. Um, so, I just wanted to clarify, you said something like um, a SIG that's not at the same level as like, the other SIGs. I think it's totally reasonable that we address that problem um, and that we would actually love to have um, people in different time zones, more diverse uh, participation in SIGs. So, I think that's really important for us to, to think about. The first time it's come on my radar, but I'm fairly new to the government. So. I'd encourage the SIG leads to get a pulse on who's attending their SIG and come up with a consensus with what makes sense with who's actively participating in it. So if you're driving an initiative that has a big European attendee attendership, then like make that friendly to that time zone. You've got a chicken and egg problem. If you pull your SIG at a time that's unfriendly. If you poll your SIG at a time that's unfriendly to them, you may not get a lot much feedback that they'd like to attend. So I think we may have to lean into that and put some to, put some time around the world to see who shows up differently. Yeah. Okay, lots of questions. Related question. Yes. I ask this question to all the communities I am involved. Like your SIG documentation is kept on Google Docs. You use Google Hangouts and those are not accessible in certain countries. I ask this to CDF as well, and they want to get up for putting the agenda or meeting information. Do you have any plans to address this to encourage or even make it easier for people to join? Now that I hear that, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's really no reason for us to say no on that. So if it, if it means that we can make the governance more accessible and more transparent, then there's really no reason to not do that. Just a quick question. What, uh, <laughs> uh, what besides Google Hangout would be better? I mean, since I have you right here. Uh, generally, Zoom works okay. mostly. Sure. So that's... Keep that in mind. Yeah, more background there is, yeah, uh, uh, Google Meet isn't available in China, I think we found out, or Google Docs is not available, so that the Chinese audience couldn't participate. So, this is great, I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, Travis, did you still have a... Uh, what, are, what are the expectations that we're getting out of the CDF, and are we getting those? Yeah. <laughs> Andy? Yeah. <laughs> the expectations of the CDF are to build a better and stronger community. Or I would say the expectation from the Spinnaker community is that by joining the CDF we'd have a stronger community. I think it's still too early to say yes or no that it's, it's, it's happening. It's worth noting that the CDF is still spinning up and so we're spending a lot of time 
as a, let's say, org figuring out what does it mean to be in the CDF. So that's why I'm surprised when uh, Slack all of a sudden has history. Uh, I'd be surprised if the CDF picked that up, but if they did, that's awesome. And that stuff like that is really what we also expect from the CDF in terms of the, them picking up uh, some of our infrastructure costs. If you aren't aware, you know, running Slack and Discourse, all these cost money, and you know, companies like Google and Netflix have been you know, putting that money in, and ideally the CDF would do that. So I'm, I'm willing to give uh, the CDF more time so that we can figure out kind of if we get all the benefits we wanted, but it's been a little slow. That's, and I think anyone in the CDF would say that. Uh, yes? Did you still have a question, Doug? Uh, um, what's the best way for an engineer to uh, determine the current sort of uh, release process? Um, in terms of like the high level releases, like 1.15, 1.16. Uh, how does someone know where in the cadence uh, we are and what tests, what types of integration tests have been run? Um, yeah. <laughs> and a stranger from the back of the room stood up to answer the question. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Travis. Uh, I am in charge of taking the uh, build and release process that is currently on the google.com infrastructure and porting that into something that is both viewable and uh, contributable by the community. Uh, right now we've been running for the last three or four years on uh, the build and releases we've gone through a very, a couple of uh, generations of uh, process on Jenkins and that has kind of grown organically and out of control. A lot of like long-lived credentials and a lot of stuff that uh, you know we did because it was only Google engineers that had access to that. Um, that is something that I'm working on over the next uh, several weeks of trying to get that cleaned up and uh, get that kicked out the door so that we can actually have external to Google contributors doing uh, like nightly uh, or like uh, patch releases, build cop duties, just kind of like the, the general chores and maintenance of the project and kind of trying to get that off of, uh, trying to get that into the, the hands of the exposure uh, for the community. So uh, hit me up on Slack if, uh, if you want to help out with that or at least yeah, test out. Mostly asking for everyone else. Yeah. yeah. I, I, there was one bit that I don't think was addressed, which is you asked like, how do we figure out where we are in the release process? Or the, the current release, like, we're currently in the beginning, middle of 1.17. Um, I think that's a good opportunity for us to build more transparency around that. Um, I hear that question a lot. I think roughly it's six to eight weeks per release. Um, and then we've done a really good job so far of like communicating when we kick off the release window, but we don't have a really good visibility into like how far into a release window or into a development. Uh, time frame we are. Um, but currently on spinnaker.io there is a release cadence page that will list the I think, upcoming like, four future releases and their target date and that date is generally when we will cut the release branches in each service and then generally approximately like one week forward from that is when we will consider it stable it's past integration test and it will be released. Um, and additionally on that page it will list the latest stable version like of each minor version so that you'll know what you should update to in each case. Okay, in the last two minutes, we're gonna do a speed round. Priority, so we're, we're coming up at the end of 2019, so when you look at 2020 in the context of Spinnaker governance and the various roles you all play within the community, what's the one thing you wanna see improved? What's like, what's your big priority? <laughs> uh, I would love to get uh, early feedback on, on new features, and uh, that, that, that just means Drop into the drop into SIGs, voice your opinion. There's no right or wrong, it's just about building consensus. So uh, it's it's much better to be proactive about voicing an opinion before we start digging the wrong hole, uh, no matter what the initiative is. For me, it's uh, simplifying the developer experience of Spinnaker itself, and that is uh, in two ways. One, if you are, there is a lot of hunger inside the community to actually get involved and get started with things, and it's difficult to get started in contributing to Spinnaker. So the first part is making it easier to get started, and then the second part 
is simplifying and standardizing more of the development of these individual services. If you look at any particular service, there's going to be a myriad of different testing tools, different languages, and that sort of thing. And when you are trying to contribute a larger feature, you have to context switch between service to service. And that is a big enough jump as it is. But then in some cases, you wind up having to context switch on the tooling that you are using to implement these features. And that is too much context switching and unnecessary. So one of the things that I would like to see is an improvement on that. We're not going to fix that in a single year, but I would like to see momentum in getting that solved. Um, to know what Rob said, uh, and to add to that, just plug, there is a current RFC proposal for a mentorship program um, out on the community repo. It's something that I'm pretty interested in. Rob and myself and Emily all kind of came up with this idea at dinner a few months ago. Um, but it's something that we'd love to pair new contributors with existing kind of more seasoned uh, contributors. And yeah, so if, you, if you're interested in that or you just want to like voice here plus one or thumbs down, just go check out the proposal and let us know. Um, this is a little bit vague, but I think it covers a lot of things that we've touched over the course of this, but I just love to see over the course of the next year us make it a lot easier for people to get involved with the community. You know, maybe some concrete examples of that are streamlining our issue triage process, getting that done, and also being better about reviewing PRs and make sure those don't stay open for as long so that people have a good experience when they join this community and we have more people join the community. Ditto to membership and more community involvement. I think specifically one thing that might be really cool for Spinnaker Summit or other meetups in the coming year would be having kind of like an in-person community bug bash where we've kind of accumulated a lot of beginner-friendly issues and you can get in-person membership, um, mentorship from a member of the community to solve that. So uh, let's give a bigger hand, a uh, round of applause for the uh, uh, just to wrap, wrap up, uh, there is another uh, panel session on roadmap, so this is kind of a continuation of this discussion, so I'd love to see a lot of you there. And I thought this was an amazing conversation in that we actually got some real-time feedback in terms of like being more inclusive for our friends outside the United States, both in time zones, but also different technologies. So this is awesome. Please keep your questions and comments and feedback you know, coming. We are uh, we're learning as we're going, and we very much want this to be an inclusive, awesome community, and it starts by you all being more involved. So thank you very much.